It's so good to be here with you all. Um, today's lesson is a very uh, beautiful lesson. I hope you've studied throughout this week. It's a beautiful lesson, a deep study actually about um, God's calling for our life. And that being said, I just like to emphasize this free offer. And the reason for that is because determining the will of God is exactly what we're going to be talking about today. It's uh, the grand theme of our study this, this, this past week. Um, since we started this, this uh, new lesson, you might have noticed that it's a very deep lesson. It's a very historical lesson. There, it, it talks a lot about dates. It talks a lot about um, events in history, about names. There are certain prophets and kings here that are connected. So you really need to study at home because, well, if you show up just for Sabbath school or if you only listen to the Sabbath school um, lesson in, in, you know, in 40 minutes, you will miss out on a lot. So don't forget to study at home. Um, we're going to get right into it. We're going to have a, a brief recap right now about the previous two lessons, um, the previous two weeks since they're the beginning of, of what we're, we're going to talk about today. Now, the previous two lessons, they introduced the main Bible themes that we're going to be studying throughout the next quarter. The main Bible themes and the main Bible characters. So we know that Ezra and Nehemiah, they play the decisive role in what we're going to be uh, studying throughout the whole quarter. But um, we also understand that as foretold by prophet Jeremiah, uh, we, we know that after 70 years, and again, this is a recap, after 70 years, he had prophesied that what would happen? The exile would end. The children of Israel would be able to return home to Jerusalem, to Israel. And this is a process that begins in the year 606 and 605, and it goes down to 537 and 536 BC. Now, the important thing here, and of course, the dates are important, the names are important, but the most important thing is for you to understand this week is that God calls and God uses people in his plan. Ultimately, this story, this lesson, it's not about Ezra, it's not about Nehemiah, it's not about Artaxerxes or about, you know, Darius or Cyrus. Ultimately, this study is about how God calls us and how God has perfect control and sovereignty of, uh, over time. God knows when things need to happen. Um, and we, we see that through this study where God uses multiple people. The Lord uses Jeremiah. The Lord uses Ezra, Nehemiah. The Lord uses Zerubbabel. He uses even pagan kings such as Cyrus and Darius, you know, and Xerxes and Artaxerxes. So we see that God, he is limitless. God has no limits. He can use anyone. And you know what that means? That means that he can even use me and you. Isn't that beautiful? He can use even me and he can use even you. Now, they say that the two most important days in anyone's life are, first of all, the day that you're born. That's a very important day, right? The day that you're born. And secondly, the day you find out why you were born. The day you figure out your purpose. What have you been born for? Why did God create you? Now, this question, this, this, this aspect of life has to do with God's calling, the calling of God. Now, each person is individual. Is, each individual is a singular, exclusive, unique being. Your father's DNA links to your mother's DNA, but the, the, the product, it's not a copy of, of the parents, is it? I know I'm not a copy of my mom or of my dad. <laughs> the product, the end product, it's not a, a, a direct copy. What comes out in the end is a unique, an exclusive, a singular being. And your singularity, this is what the Bible teaches, your singularity, your uniqueness reaches its maximum potential. Its maximum potential when you understand that you are unique. And when you submit your life, when you submit your talents and your gifts to God's will when you strive to understand what his will is for your life. And we find this over again in the Bible. We find that many times there are different people writing uh, mystified. For example, we find the psalmist in Psalm 39 saying, your eyes have seen my substance being yet unformed. And in your book, they are all written. Mystified, the psalmist writes, look, you have seen all the days of my life. To Ananias in, in the book of Acts in the New Testament, we find the Lord saying, speaking about the calling of Paul now, God says, go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine. Now, do you think that God's foreknowledge, that his, uh, uh, God seeing the future, do you think that that only applies to Paul and to David? Of course not. That applies to all of us. 
The Bible tells us that the Lord, he has counted our days. He knows what is going to happen. And this foreknowledge, in this foreknowledge, he has a plan, a plan even for me and for you, a mission for me and for you. It's also not surprising that um, when, we, when we frustrate God's plan, when we go outside of what his will is for our life, it's a, it's a big disaster, isn't it? We see that also in the Bible. For example, King Saul. God had a plan, didn't he? And King Saul frustrated that plan. And look at the end. It was disastrous. Look at um, Jonah. How, what would have happened, let's, let's imagine, what would have happened if he hadn't run away at first? If he had gone? We know that the Lord did end up saving the Ninevites, but we find a very a very sour, a very um, unhappy prophet at the end of the book. What would have happened if he had submitted his will, to, his will to the Lord? When we frustrate God's plan, only disaster comes from that. Only disaster comes from that. The question that we have to come out from all of this study, the true question, and we're going to get into it, but I want you to ask yourself this not only now, but throughout the week. The question that we have to have after a study like this is, well then, what is God's calling for my life? What does he want from me? I really believe that one of the most important prayers that anyone can pray throughout their life is, Lord, where do I fit in? What is my place in your plan? I'm, I'm sure that many of you, if not all, have prayed that or asked the Lord that in one moment or another in your life. I know I have multiple times. I still pray it sometimes. What is your will, Father? for my life. What do you want? Show me my place according to your will. He has for each person a very special place in his grand plan for the human race. And what's more, all are called. Everyone is called. And some are called for very decisive roles. Some of us are called for very decisive roles very decisive roles. Ezra and Nehemiah, and that's what we study, you know, in this whole lesson, and this week, Ezra and Nehemiah, they were called for different functions. They had different abilities, different backgrounds, training, different personalities. Ezra, for example, he was a scribe. The Bible tells us in Ezra 7.10, the Bible tells us his attitude. Look at what we read here. For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach statutes and ordinances in Israel. So Ezra, he knew what he was good at and that's also something important in life. What talents, what gifts has God given you? Recognize them and employ them in, in, in the service of the king, in the service of heaven. So Ezra, it, the Bible tells us that he determined, he determined his heart to seek the law of the Lord. And not only to seek it, there are many of us that only study the Bible. Is that enough? It's not. Because when you study, when you study the Bible, you're not studying something um, abstract. It's not an abstract study. You're studying a person. You're getting to have a relationship with him. And because of that, you want to teach. You want to show other people. And this is what happens to Ezra. The Bible tells us that Ezra, he determined his heart, not only to study the law of the Lord, but to do what else? To teach it. To teach it. And so he was used in a very decisive role. The New Testament gives us three lists, three major lists of gifts. And of course, God, he can add more gifts to these, to these lists. Is God limit, uh, limited to the gifts that we find here in the Bible? Of course not. If any new need should arise, the Lord would add more and more and more gifts to uh, these lists. But we find that the supreme gift, the supreme fruit is what? The fruit of the Spirit. We find in Galatians 5.22 um, and 23, we find what the Lord says about this, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And what I mean to say by this is we can't all have the same gifts. You know, some people are good at singing. I know I'm not. I wish I was. That's not my gift. My gift isn't singing. There are some people that can preach, that can teach. Other people are amazing greeters. Now, we don't all have the same gifts. To some, the gift of singing was given. To others, the gift of preaching or teaching was given. To others, the gift of, 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 of greeting. To others, the gift of being a good host, of being a good companion, of listening. Have you ever been around someone that's a good listener? That can hear you very well? Some people have that gift. Now, we can't all have these gifts, but the supreme fruit of the Spirit, that is something that God expects of us. Love, 
that is something that we should all have because that's not something that you can live as a Christian without. A great problem to many Christians is that many, and I don't know what kind of Christian you are, I know that sometimes I even do this, but many Christians, they spend their time lamenting a gift that they don't have. Lord, why couldn't I sing better? Lord, why couldn't I teach better? Oh, Lord, why couldn't I be bold enough to greet? Have you ever done something like that? Kind of complain to God, Lord, look at that person singing so beautifully. How I wish I could do that. I've done that a few times. <laughs> After hearing myself sing, I'm thinking, Lord, why can't I sing better? Many Christians, they spend a lot of time complaining for the gifts that they don't have, and in the end, they don't employ, they don't use the gifts that they do have. What do we learn from the, the parable of, of, of the talents in the Bible? The one who used his gift more was given to him, more gifts were given. And the one that didn't use it, well, what happened? He lost, even what he had, he lost. So do you want more gifts? Do you want more responsibility? Use what you have. Start with what you have in your hands. The calling of Ezra and Nehemiah, they were beautiful callings for decisive roles. Ezra was able to use his gift to train and to teach the children of Israel for, thor for 13 years in Jerusalem. And those must not have been easy years for Ezra. He went there and he taught those people. The Bible says, and the word here is the word kun in Hebrew, to determine his heart. And due to this, the Lord was able to use him powerfully. Nehemiah, had a, he had a different personality. When you find Nehemiah, he had a strong, almost aggressive, isn't that right? Almost aggressive personality. And the, the traits, the character traits, the talents that God gave him, they were different from Ezra, but they were no less important because to Nehemiah, the gift of leadership was given. Even before he arrives in Jerusalem, he had to rack up the, you know, the nerve, the, 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 the boldness, the courage to speak to whom? To the king, to Artaxerxes, and ask him to allow him to go. And how long did he pray for this? What does the lesson say? He had to pray for about four months. He heard the news coming from Jerusalem that, and we studied this last week, he heard the news that the things, things were not going they were not happening in Jerusalem and he cried and he prayed and he poured himself before the Lord and he was waiting for the right moment. And because he was a cupbearer, he had a good contact with the king. He had proximity to the king. One day the king came and, said, and saw that he was sad and said, well, why are you sad? Now the Bible says that Nehemiah had that moment. He did what? He prayed to the Lord. And this is where you see the humanity of the person, of the man behind the book, you know, because I can't imagine this a moment where the king comes and says, what's mad? You're sad. And then he hears it. He says, uh, hold on a bit, king. He goes out, he kneels down, he prays, and then he comes back. I don't see that happening. I see Nehemiah. You know that, that, that lightning prayer where he says, Lord, please bless me. Lord, please help me. Lord, please save me. You know those lightning prayers? I, I imagine Nehemiah at that moment saying, Lord, please use me right now. And he gets into it. And he says, in a very diplomatic form, he says, you know, King, I, I would like to go back to help my people. And because of his proximity, his responsibilities, the, the talents that God had given him of leadership, of administration, he was the perfect man for that job. The king trusted him. This was the same king that had halted the construction before. So Nehemiah had to be very careful of how he worded this. But the Lord helped him. The Lord used him. You see, there are some gifts that are more visual than others. Obviously, the gifts of singing or of preaching, they're more visual because, well, people are, you know, you're teaching people, you're singing to, pe to people. And sometimes people with more visual gifts, they tend to belittle people with other gifts. Imagine if perhaps Nehemiah, who was, you know, a cupbearer to the king, if he had belittled, I don't know, maybe someone with a, a very important talent back in Jerusalem. We can't belittle other people because their gifts aren't as visual, perhaps, as our own. All are used. God can use all in the most extraordinary and powerful ways. It is vital for us to recognize the gifts and the work that people previously have done. Nehemiah, he was only able to do what he did, and Ezra, because they stood atop the shoulders of Zerubbabel, the shoulders of Jeremiah, Daniel, the people who had come before. I believe it was... Uh, Thomas Edison who said that he was only able to invent what he invented and do what he did because he stood atop the shoulders of giants, the men who had come before him and figured out and found out and discovered the things that he used to invent, you know, what, what he did invent. Sometimes we have to stand atop the shoulders of giants. When it comes to how God handles prophecy, prophetic timing, um, 
It's a beautiful thing because we see, apparently, humanly, we see some disconnected points in history. And sometimes people ask, well, how is all of this coming together? Well, when you look behind the scenes, you have the master guider, the master king, who has control of all time. As we study the Bible, it becomes obvious that God has perfect control over time. Always. God knows what is happening. The lesson gives us a list of people, and it's just so impressive that these people were there when the prophecies were being meant to, to be fulfilled. For example, we find Noah commissioned to build the ark um, during the time of the flood. I, didn't know if you, I don't know if you know this, but Enoch, when he named Methuselah, Methuselah's name, it literally means after this one, the waters will come. Did you know that? His name was a prophecy for the flood. And Noah was there to fulfill that. You find Abraham called out of his father's, um, his father's land. Moses, what a calling. Joshua, Samuel, Hosea and Amos, Ezekiel and Daniel, Haggai and Zechariah, Ezra and Nehemiah, John the Baptist, Stephen, more recently Ellen White. Do you see that God is in control of time? And here's a beautiful thing about God. God is transparent. He doesn't do things, you know, in a backhanded sort of way. He doesn't hide what he's doing. The Bible tells us that God doesn't do anything without first doing what? Revealing his will to his servants, the prophets. We're not left in the dark. Not only is God in control, God allows us to know. He tells us what he is going to do. That is the kind of God that we have. Jeremiah prophesied the return of the people from captivity after a period of 70 years. God did not leave them in the dark as to how long they would be in exile. To that end, God first raised up, raised up Zerubbabel, then Ezra, and then 13 later, years later after Ezra, he raised up Nehemiah. However, from, from Jeremiah all the way down to Nehemiah, God used many people. Maybe even some people that we don't know. People that are not mentioned in the word but God used many people. Now, the chronology places Artaxerxes' intervention in 457 BC. And this is where the lesson, it becomes, um, timing becomes crucial. Now again, this is a deep lesson, a very historical lesson, so please bear with me. But chronology places Artaxerxes' intervention in 457 BC. Because, and, and this is why it's so important to us, because this decree given by this king in 457, it's tied to another prophecy. Which prophecy? The prophecy of Daniel chapter 9, verse 25 of the 70 weeks. Look at what it says. Now therefore, understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. Two items are interconnected here, okay? And when we study this, of course we don't have the time to go in depth. We don't have time for a seminary here. But two things here um, remain broadly crucial. First of all, the date itself. The date itself. Since there were three individual decrees given in three different moments by three different kings, why do we use this one, 457? If we have a decree, a decree given by um, Cyrus, and then we have another decree given by Darius, and then we have another decree now here given by Artaxerxes, why do we use this last one, 457, to understand Daniel 9, um, 9.25? There are a few reasons, okay? And here, this is important for you as an Adventist here, or you if you're studying to become or studying to understand uh, who the Adventists are, it's important for you to understand uh, th these dates and, and the reasons why we use this, this year. Because the way we understand these 490 years and the way we understand the 2300 years, that's crucial. That's basically who we are. If you take that away, if you detract that from the Adventist message, there will be simply no Adventist message. So it's crucial for you to understand this. Now the reason why we use this date, the date of 457 BC, is, well, first of all, only the decree of Artaxerxes includes the concern, includes concern for the city of Jerusalem. The previous two uh, decrees, they didn't say much about the walls. They didn't say much about the city. They were talking about what? The temple. They were mostly talking about the temple. Then when Artaxerxes gives his decree, we find that he mentions the reconstruction of Jerusalem, the rebuilding of the city. Um, that's one of the reasons why we use this, uh, this date, 457 BC. If we use any other date, if you use any other date for the 490 years of Daniel, um, 
that wouldn't lead us to Messiah the Prince. If you use any other date, it wouldn't take you to anywhere. Anything significant in history, it fits. It's a very good fit. And it stands to reason because it's what we believe to be true. So King Artaxerxes, he, he, he gives this decree in 457 BC as uh, a decree to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem and therefore, we believe that that is the beginning date of the second thing that we're going to mention here, which is the day-year principle. Have you ever wondered why, I don't know, maybe you have, maybe you haven't. I know that when I was younger, I used to see um, uh, us interpreting these, uh, these, these time schemes, and I wanted to understand why we use the day-year principle. And it's very simple. The Bible gives us these principles in um, Numbers 14.34 and Ezekiel 4, 5, and 6. Many people tend to interpret this literally. They'll say, well, there's 490 years, there's 70 weeks, right? Let's interpret this literally. The problem with that is that you don't get anywhere. With a literal interpretation, how much is 490 uh, days, literally? That's about a year and a half, a little bit more than a year and a half, perhaps? Right, right around there? What happened in the year 456, 455? Nothing significant. Not, certainly not a Messiah, the prince. So if you interpret this literally, you get uh, nowhere. We have to understand that in the Bible, prophecy is interconnected. If you want to understand, for example, uh, Revelation, where do you go? Daniel. Daniel and the Old Testament. If you want to understand the ten plagues, where do you go? The seven plagues, I'm sorry. You go to the ten plagues of Exodus. So one thing in the Bible is connected to the other. It has to be that way. Otherwise, we get nowhere. Prophecy will mean nothing. It will be just someone coming up with ideas, and that's, that's what the world is full of around us. We find many people coming up with the craziest ideas because they're not being guided by the Bible, by connecting the dots in the Bible itself. The 70 weeks end in the year 34 AD when Stephen is martyred when the Jewish nation of the time, they rejected Jesus. They rejected God's chosen servant. The half of the week, um, that coincides with what? The death of Jesus, the crucifixion. And that's where we believe that Jesus, he confirmed a covenant with many, and we read that in Daniel 9, 27. Now, Adventists, and please, again, uh, we don't have all the time in the world to go into this, so please bear with me. Um, Adventists have been severely criticized in their understanding of this prophecy. Severely criticized. Especially in this part of the 70 weeks that have been determined. And the main argument used against Adventists is in the interpretation of the word determined. We literally believe that the word determined means to be cut off. It has been cut off. And that's how we understand that this prophecy of 490 years given in Daniel chapter 9 chapter 9, it is cut off from the larger time period prophecy of where? Daniel chapter 8 of the 2300 years. So we believe that it has been cut off. One thing is part of the other and that's where we've been criticized. They say um, that the interpretation of this word that we use is, is wrong because it's only used once in the whole Hebrew Bible. It's only used here in Daniel. And that's the main argument given against us in, this, in, 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 this, in regard to this. That this word, it's only used once in the whole Hebrew Bible here by Daniel and that it doesn't mean cut off. It means to be determined or decreed. And that would change everything because if the word is determined, then it doesn't have to do with the larger time prophecy of Daniel chapter 8. So that's the criticism. Do you understand? They say that we use or we interpret the word wrong, the word determined incorrect. Now, the question is how solid is this argument? It is a fact, unfortunately or fortunately, however you want to see this, it is a fact that this word is only used once. In the whole Hebrew Bible, this word, which is the word shatak, it's only used once in the whole Hebrew Bible. But, nevertheless, and again, this, this is going to get a bit amusing, but um, first, this other words, other words such as decree or such as determined, they appear in the Hebrew Bible, and they are not the word shatak. So one of the questions is, well, why didn't Daniel use, if what he wanted to mean was decree or determine, 70 weeks are determined for you, well, why didn't he use these other words? Why did he go with this more obscure, this more mysterious word, shatak? He should have used, I mean, if he wanted to mean determine or if he wanted to mean decreed, shouldn't he have used those words? 
That's what you would expect. But no, he uses this less known, this more obscure word called shatak. Secondly, while shatak isn't used anywhere in Hebrew scripture, it appears numerous times in Jewish writings such as the Mishnah. The Jewish Bible commentary, which was compiled, it already existed in oral form, but it was compiled in the first two centuries uh, AD. And that word, chartak, is, is there. And while the, 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 the Hebrew and the Mishnah isn't exactly alike the Hebrew in the Old Testament, they are very similar. And there, the word chartak is used many times. In fact, it's used 12 times. And 10 of those 12 times, it refers to the cutting off of animal parts, according to the dietary laws. Of the 19 times that this word is used as a noun, in the noun form, not as a verb, but as a noun, 19 times, 18 times, it appears as that which is cut off. Not only this, Strong's Concordance gives its primary root to cut off. Whiting's translation, which is a very well-known translation, has it as cut off. Jesenius, is the standard Hebrew lexographer, defines it as to cut off. The Chaldeo Rabbinic Dictionary of Stoicius defines it as to cut, to cut away to cut into pieces, to engrave, or to cut off. The earliest versions of the Vulgate or the Septuagint define the verb here, shartak, as cutting off. Theodosian's Greek version of the word renders it to cut off. Even more versions use the term cut off. Do you get the point? <laughs> cut off is a perfectly good explanation. It's a good, perfectly good interpretation of this word, shartak. Perfectly fine. Actually, it's the best one we have. So to say that this word isn't that, it doesn't mean that, well, that, then we would be playing a guessing game. That would be the guessing game, not to interpret it as cut off. As the lesson tells us, there are many reasons, um, there are many reasons why we believe that the 70 year, the 70 week prophecy of Daniel 9 and the 2300 uh, year prophecy of Daniel chapter 8, they belong together. First of all, both are time prophecies, right? That by itself doesn't mean much, but both are time prophecies. Second, the terminology, vision, understanding, link them together. Both interpretations were given by whom? Gabriel. The same person, the same angel, the same messenger is interpreting them. Uh, lastly, and this to me is the most important reason, the only part of the vision of chapter 8, the only part of the vision of chapter 8 of the 2300 years um, that was not explained is exactly this one of the 2300 years. The rest of the vision in chapter eight is explained by, by Gabriel. Why didn't he explain the 2300 years? And then you go to chapter nine, a few years later, then you have the interpretation. Daniel chapter eight contains two parts. You have a vision and you have an interpretation of the vision. Daniel chapter nine doesn't really have a vision. It only has an interpretation. And the interpretation, it has to do with something. What was the only thing that had not been interpreted yet? The vision of the 2300 years. Do you see how one is tied to the other? This might be a bit confusing and I urge you to study more on this. This uh, good part of your comprehension of, uh, of, of Adventism and of the Bible prophecies, um, they will be hinged upon this, this matter of Daniel chapter seven, eight, and nine. But we believe that these two prophecies, the cutting off of these, this period of 490 years, they have to do with the vision of the 2300 years that go from 457. What happened in 457? Artaxerxes gave, issued a, dec a decree that the walls of Jerusalem should be built. And from then on, we start counting not only the 490 years that end in the year 34, but we end in the year 1844 with tw the 2300 years. That is one of our most basic beliefs. And this is why we believe it. Praise the Lord. For all these reasons and more, we believe that these two prophecies, they belong together. Daniel 8 and 9, they are tied together. The, 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 next, um, the next topic that we find in the lesson, and this is something that I really want to get into, um, is the topic of biblical election. This might be a, a, as confusing or maybe even more confusing than, uh, than about all the dates. Because when it comes to dates, really it's a matter of you sitting down, concentrating, and, and, and trying to figure out what prophecy is, is talking about. When it comes to election, there's just so much debate. When it comes to how God chooses people or what God's choosing people means, there's just so much debate. It's so um, controversial that it might be a bit intimidating for a few people. 
God's election in the Bible has nothing to do with predestination, as many would believe. We're not talking here about predestination in, in a certain sense. God has chosen how many for salvation? All. All are chosen. What does John 3.16 tell us? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever, whosoever is an all-inclusive word. Whosoever. Does whosoever exclude anyone? Whosoever except, except Lucas. Whosoever except my Brazilians. Whosoever except the Granite Bay Church. No. <laughs> whosoever is an all-inclusive word. All are chosen. All are on God's map of salvation. Everyone is on his radar. Now, the only way that you can not be on that map or not be on that radar of salvation if you choose for yourself to exclude yourself. That's the only way because God does not violate our will. So when, God, when we're talking about God's election, first of all, we're talking that when it comes to salvation, it's for everyone. In theology, this is called soteriology, the doctrine of salvation, all right, how God saves us. All are chosen, all are on the map. Now, on the other hand, and this is something that I, I struggled for for a while uh, when I was younger, is about God's free will. Because God also has free will, doesn't he? <coughs> I should hope so. God also has free will. And the fact that God has free will means that he has the freedom of choosing whoever he wants for certain roles. When it comes to salvation, God doesn't meddle with that. Everyone is chosen. Everyone should be saved. But when it comes to some certain roles, then some people are chosen. Some specific, particular people are chosen. For example, it was Paul, not Peter, that God chose to write 14 books in the New Testament because of his training, his background, his knowledge. He prepared himself for this. And that teaches me something, that natural talent placed under God's hand, placed and submitted to God's word, that talent, that natural talent becomes divine talent. Now, you might be good at something. You might be very good. You might have a very good talent. Trust me, it can get better. You know how? By submitting it to God. Because in the end, my friends, uh, actually, before I say this, let me say something else. You might have a very good talent, but at the same time, maybe you are not good at, at something. Trust me, God can still use you. Maybe you try to imagine, well, what can I do? I'm in a church with 600 people. I'm in, you know, there are so many people around me. I live in a city with, I don't know, two, three million people, 10 million people. What can I do? How can I be used by God? I can't sing. I can't preach. I can't, I don't know. I can't be a deacon. I can't be an elder. I can't be this. I can't be the, what do I do? Look, what matters is not, what determines God's usage of you and how you can be of service is not your ability or your disability, but your availability. That's it. Because the rest, while it could be important, you know, a natural talent could be very important, very good, but if you're not available, it's for nothing. If Ezra or Nehemiah or Moses, if they had been good at all that they were good at, but they hadn't been available to God, well, how would he use them? He couldn't use them. Romans 9.13 uh, this is a very confusing text for many. Romans 9.13 tells us that uh, God loved Jacob and he hated Esau. This, my friends, has no soteriological meaning. What I mean by that is this doesn't, the issue here isn't salvation. God didn't love Jacob for salvation and hate Esau, condemning him to, 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 to death, eternal death, without a choice from Esau. That's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is that God chose Jacob for a specific purpose role inside his plan. Does that make sense? God chose Jacob. He loved Jacob. That This is classic Semitic um, literature. All right? God loved Jacob for a purpose. That doesn't mean that God hated Esau for him to die forever for no, for no reason whatsoever without a choice, without a, a say in the matter. That's not what we're talking about. The issue isn't salvation, but different roles inside the plan of salvation. Now, We've studied a little bit about these prophets, the calling of Ezra and Nehemiah. We've studied a little bit of how this prophecy played out in their life. The prophecy given by Daniel a few years before played out in the life of Ezra and Nehemiah. Wouldn't it be cool for you to fulfill prophecy and to know that you're fulfilling prophecy? 
Imagine how it was for them. I don't know if they, if they uh, were thinking about this as it was happening, if it dawned upon them. It's always easier with, uh, you know, after, after the things happen. You know, it's always easier for you to determine. But it must have been so amazing to fulfill a prophecy that had been given, to fulfill the beginning of that spectacular prophecy that one day the Savior, the Messiah, he would come. And they could know the exact year. It must have been spectacular. We've studied that. We've also studied a little bit how God considers salvation. All are chosen, all are on God's map, unless we decide to exclude ourselves. We've seen how God, he can, and this is where we talk about election, he does elect some people for specific roles. But the, 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 the important thing that we have to come to now at the end with eight minutes, what we have to understand is, well, what is my responsibility? What do I have to do now? What does God expect from me? How am I responsible? Do you know what etymology, etymology I don't know if I'm, if I'm saying that right, but the, the meaning of the word responsibility, do you know what that means? The ability of response. That's what the word, its roots mean. The ability of giving a good answer, a good response. So what is my, what should be my good response? How should I? Be it choosing Nehemiah, be it choosing Ezra, or certain other individual for certain roles in God's plan, he wants us to know, he wants me to know that he can bless and transform me. Not only can he transform me and make and give me a blessing, but he can make me a blessing. That's my calling, to be a blessing. Ultimately, the saints are called to what? To be a blessing to this dark world. To take light where there is darkness, to take joy where there is sadness and, 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 and anger. Peace to where there is anger. Ezra and Nehemiah, and here you have the, the difference between certain people. Ezra and Nehemiah, did they kind of ponder, were they reluctant to answer God's call? No, they weren't. They went readily. They wanted it. But you do find a few others that they were kind of reluctant. Remember Moses? Moses was very reluctant. Moses had been in the desert for 40 years. He was 80 years old. Who, who, who starts thinking of a grand scheme for their life when they're 80? Maybe, maybe someone does, okay? Maybe you do, I don't know. I know that when I'm 80, I wanna be up and kicking still. I wanna be doing a lot of stuff. But usually you don't have someone, you know, thinking of, a, of the next 40 years, a plan for the next 40 years when they're 80 years old. So Moses, he was like, is, is, is God blind? Is he, you know, is, doesn't he know how old I am? Doesn't he know that I'm already tired? I'm not, there. I'm heavy of tongue. And we're, we're actually, I'm gonna mention that. Moses, he came up with his best arguments. He used his sociological argument, his knowledge about others. Lord, they're not gonna believe me. Who am I to teach them, to talk to them? Look at me. I used to be a prince there. They hate me. I killed one of the officials. They drove me out. Who am I? They're, no one's gonna hear me. That's his sociological argument, which God destroyed. God broke that argument. He said, look, when you go there, you just tell them that the I am sent you. Yahweh, the eternal one. Man, sometimes I've seen, you know, I've seen movies about, about Moses' calling. And at that moment at the burning bush, there isn't one time that goes by that I either read it or see it that I don't, I, I, tears don't come to my eyes. Imagine being in the presence of Yahweh. Imagine him knowing your name and you hearing him call you by name. We know that he knows us by name, but imagine hearing it, that he remembered and he is going to use you as a chosen vessel. And Moses, he gives first his sociological argument. Then when that's been destroyed, he gives his psychological argument, his knowledge not, not, not about others now, but his knowledge about himself. Lord, look at me. I'm heavy of tongue, I'm heavy of speech. I've been here shouting at sheep for the past 40 years. Now you're gonna put me to shout in front of Pharaoh? That's not gonna work, Lord. That's not going to work. Too old. My ability is not qualified for this project that Yahweh is giving me. Which Yahweh, and you, you, when you read it, God appears very optimistic about this plan. <laughs> Moses was the doubter in the story. He's the one saying, I don't know, Lord. <laughs> the Lord insisted with him. The Lord did insist with him. The Lord knew Moses better than he knew himself. And here's something important for you. The Lord knows you better than you know yourself. He knows that in the future, if you do follow his plan, as hard as it may be, 
you will be happy. You'll be happy that you did. You'll be happy that you did. You know, many times I've heard people use arguments about, um, you know, well, why can't I just live my life, the pleasures that I want to and do what I want, and at, at the very end, I'll, I'll come to God. And, uh, well, first of all, you know that you, know that you don't know when you'll die. That's uncertain to us. Who, who can guarantee that, that I will have time to come to God? But mo most of all, I, I think, for example, of the, the difference between Isaac in the Bible and the, the thief on the cross, the good thief. Who lived a better life? Isaac. He was born, raised, and he lived a relationship with God. Both will be in heaven, we know this, but who lived a better life? The one that walked with God. So we're not only talking about salvation, we're talking about quality of life here and now. A quality of life that God gives you by walking with him, by having a relationship with him. Looking back at the end of his life, I'm certain that Moses, he, was, uh, he would admit that this was his greatest and best decision. He could have said no, couldn't he? Of course he could. He could have said, look, Lord, I know, and he tried. In the end, he even gave the excuse that it's not a psychological, it's really an excuse given on laziness. Lord, I know all this, but please send another. But God knew Moses better than he knew himself. Moses could have insisted. He could have run away from God. But he didn't. And I'm sure that at the end, looking back, he would tell you, he would admit that was the best decision. Imagine to be a companion to God, to hear his voice, to see his back at least. <laughs> To have him, to have God have his back? That's a, that's a privilege. And Moses would be the first one to admit that. God comes, when God appears to Moses, he says, Moses, what do you have in your hands? And this is where it gets real for you and for me. Moses, what do you have in your hands? What did he have? A staff. A symbol of his pathetic wanderings in the desert for 40 years. A symbol of his simpleness shepherd but God transformed that staff in an instrument of omnipotence where was the power though was it in the staff no the power was with God so today God's calling to you might be might be a question he might be asking you look my dear friend what do you have in your hands maybe not a lot of money maybe not many gifts or talents to be used. Maybe a painful history, a painful past. Traumas, heartache. The power isn't in what is in your hands. The power is with God. Sister White tells us that anyone that submits himself or herself to the Lord, anyone that places themselves in his hands, become instruments of omnipotence you can become an instrument of my omnipotence. That is God's calling for you. My deep and profound prayer for each one of us here is that we learn to become instruments of omnipotence, regardless of what we hold in our hands. May God bless you, may he use you, may he teach you and educate you and show you what his calling for your life is. May God bless you. Thank you so much for um, being with us for this Bible study hour this week. I hope you... Return next week and study your lesson. We have a great lesson to learn, a lot to learn. May God bless you.